Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. At the time of this recording, we're putting together a program specifically designed for people who identify as intuitive thinker women. So NT, those would be the four NT types. ENTPs, INTPs, ENTJs, and INTJs. And so I'm really, really kind of in this space. I'm thinking a lot about what are some of the challenges that people of these four types really experience and what are the challenges unique to NT women? So we sent out a survey to request people who are subscribed to our email list to tell us what some of their challenges are. And I think this is one of my favorite things about putting together a program is that we get responses from real people about what they are dealing with. And of course, we've sent out surveys for years for all 16 types. And so we've had literally hundreds of NT women tell us what their biggest challenges are. And right now, because I'm going through and coming through all of these, it's really struck me how even though these are four very different types, and you know, even if you like live at the intersection of being a woman and being an NT, even though these four types are very different, that intersection has a lot of crossover. There are a lot of challenges that NT women face that I don't really think that people of other types ever really think about. A part of it, of course, is that this is a demographic that is not very well represented. Some of the least represented of the types when you include gender are are NT women. And I think I think the number one is ENTJ women. I think it used to be thought that it was INFJ men. But then when the numbers uh, were sort of reevaluated recently, it's actually ENTJ women, which comprise of like less than 1% of the population. And so this is a demographic of people that don't have a lot of acknowledgement, don't have a lot of like say programs created for them, don't have a lot of resources or models in, you know, in media or in you know different characters like it's really hard to find somebody that you can really identify with when you when you fit into this demographic well and if you're a new listener antonia is also an nt woman you're an entp in the myers-briggs system so this is something that's near and dear to your heart because throughout your life you've had similar challenges this has been something that you've had to navigate I mean, from the time you were very young, you have a lot of messages, I think, as a woman particularly, of how you're supposed to show up to the world. And then you don't show up that way. And it's like, uh oh, what, what do I do? How, how do I how do I make my my way through this world that doesn't feel like it's very much set up for me? And you find strategies. And sometimes those strategies create their own problems or challenges because the strategies themselves now open a whole bunch of other loops that now be, become their own challenges in themselves. Yeah, I think what's what's fascinating is getting this feedback that most people who are like who are like me, who identify as NT women, don't really have a sense of entitlement about how the world is supposed to treat them. In fact, that's the one thing I see over and over and over again is that there's there's no sense that you know, like every, why aren't people coming to me? Like there's this just assumption that we have to go to everyone else. Nobody's going to understand who we are, where we're coming from. Nobody is going to be able to cross that, that chasm. We have to build the bridge to go to them. And because we are wired to be natural problem solvers, we get like we immediately as as soon as we realize that the world is not responding to us in the same way it's responding to everybody else we immediately get to work on building that bridge we are so used to meeting people where they're at and we're so used to having to play in other people's sandboxes and the the responses i get back from women you know women who fit into these this criteria is that there's no there's no belief that other people should be coming to us like there's no there's no uh, assumption that it's even possible. And so because of that, all of the challenges were really about managing exhaustion, <laughs> dealing with aloneness, dealing with tiredness, dealing with having to work so hard to meet everybody else where they're at and still failing. And the, the, 
the na- the wiring to to solve problems means that there's not a lot of time spent for it, just being in the experience itself. There's not a lot of emotional real estate applied back to the self on like how like there's no there's not a lot of feeling sorry for oneself. There's not a lot of taking the time to sort of sit in the experience. It, it's really hyper focused on solving the problem, and so there's a th- that alone creates a problem that alone the 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 assumption that the if there is a problem i must solve it and if i'm not getting the feedback that i want to then i have to figure out how to make that happen means that there's this almost energetic sieve that is created in all so- social interactions and when i've talked to and interviewed different nt women and i reflect that back to them because they'll, I'll say, you know, like, do you feel, and and I'll say something that you know is is a, a universal NT woman experience. Do you struggle with feeling less feminine? And almost always the response is like, no, no, that's fine. That's not th- that big of a deal. And then I'll kind of penetrate a little bit underneath the surface, and I'll talk about the experiences I've heard from other NT women, and I'll talk about some of the challenges that are woven in. And there's like this dawning, uh, you know, the, this this look that comes on their face that they're like they're the, like a dawning acceptance that this is actually a problem and this is actually something that they experience. And they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I guess you're right. And then I'll say, well, how, how much energy goes into trying to feel more feminine or how much energy has gone into trying to solve this challenge? And then they'll go, oh, wow, um, I guess a lot okay, well, how much energy do you apply trying to meet other people where they're at? I guess a lot. And and it it's almost like we don't take an accounting of how much we're applying to try, trying to solve these problems because the assumption is the onus is on us to do so. So you use this phrase of trying to feel more feminine. And as a man, help me understand what does that mean to most NT women. When you say try to feel more feminine, what are you trying to feel in those moments? Well, there are certain pictures of what femininity is and how it responds to the environment and how others respond to it in the environment. And this challenge with feeling feminine is actually tied to one of the other challenges that came up over and over, which is dealing with traditional gender roles. And oftentimes in conversations around traditional gender roles, particularly as it relates to women, there's this assumption that it's the masculine that is trying to sort of put, you know, sort of wedge you into a, a you know, a certain shape or um, a certain like a, like round, round pegs and square holes. But when you identify as an NT woman, it's actually everybody everybody is see, is expecting you to show up in a certain way. And, and this makes sense because of the sheer numbers of feeler women. So the assumption is that all women are going to be feelers. The stereotypes around things like women's intuition and what, and what that is, which I've kind of noodled out, is basically a, a definition of extroverted feeling, which is the, the decision-making or judging function of the majority of women. Like that's highly represented in women. You mean like being able to just understand social rules without them being spoken? Yeah, and anticipating needs and anticipating emotional challenges and anticipating like what's going on for another person and being really tied in with that. And so there's an assumption that women just naturally have that. And so it's actually, it's not the kind of intuition that we would define in sort of like looking at Jungian psychology as intuition. It's not introverted or extroverted intuition. It's more just, it's the pattern recognition that comes along with just looking at certain things for your entire lifetime, which is what is going on for other people and how do I help get those needs met? And and it's sort of an emotional sophistication. And so there's an assumption that women will automatically come with these traits and when you don't, when it's particularly difficult or even worse, when you trample over them unintentionally because they're part of your blind spot or they're what we would call shadow functions and, co- you know, in cognitive function theory, then there is a um, 
the the next assumption, the first assumption is you're going to be good at this, and then the next assumption is, well, then you're you're actually being deliberately hurtful because women are supposed to just come prepackaged with this, and if you haven't, then you must be trying to you know dick with the system. You must you must be trying to make things bad, and so when you don't have this as a natural strength, you get a lot of feedback that you're unkind or you are um, that that you're self-centered or that you're just kind of, you know, sort of like emotionally idiotic in all of this. So that creates this really weird dissonance with the part of you that knows you're highly intelligent and you're an incredible problem solver and you're really good at getting things done and your your self-identity or at least for myself, I'll speak for myself, and this is seems to have been echoed in a lot of the survey responses, is that your image of yourself is that you're incredibly capable. In fact, capable and competent are things that we highly prize. And so we're trying to build skill in all the ways that we can. We're trying to be capable and competent in all the ways that we can. And then there there's this thing around being a woman that some for some reason you just cannot get on that track. <laughs> like you just can't seem to quite... It's like you just didn't get the memo. Everybody else got the memo and you didn't. Now, on the plus side, because there's so much insistence around women being good at this, on the plus side, there's less one-sidedness for NT women because they're kind of forced into developing some of these. But they're never easy. And the the underlying communication is that you should be naturally good at this. And if you're not, then that's your, that's your problem. You're the problem, not, not the assumption, you. And I think that that's why women who, you know, NT women don't have an entitlement about other people meeting them where they're at because there's, there's a baseline assumption that we're the ones who are off or broken. And so if the and and also the other node in the system or one of the other nodes in the system is that we're problem solvers. So when we hear the feedback that we're the ones who are off and then we tie that with our natural wiring, which is that we need to solve the problem, then we spend our whole life not even recognizing how much we're trying to meet other people where they're at, how much we're attempting to, you know, basically, as I mentioned, play in other people's sandboxes. And we we lose count of how tiring that is, or we like lose connection to how exhausting it is to try to have to constantly be doing that. We just define it as like lonely, or having trouble making friends, or really being protective of our energy, or wanting to be alone a lot. Like that's how we define it in our minds. But really, it's that we lose so much mental and emotional real estate trying to play a game that we are not wired to be good at. You, uh, a few years ago, went to a birthday party of a friend of ours who's a feeler. And you'd actually flown to this party. It was another state away, multiple states away. So you had to fly. And you went to the birthday party. And I remember you calling me that evening. And you were exhausted. You had basically articulated you'd done a lot of feeler stuff all day with a lot of other women who are feelers. And you had actually gone to this birthday party because you were seeking sisterhood. You were seeking to hang out with other women and you were very, very tired. I, I think you were one of the only thinker women there, if I remember correctly. There might have been another one. Well, it was an all day sisterhood event. Yeah. And in the morning for breakfast, uh, an I, a woman with INTJ preferences had come to breakfast and she and I like immediately started talking and jelling, but then she had to go. And so for the rest of the day... You're by yourself then. I was, I was the only thinker for the rest of the day. Did you have fun? I mean, was it like miserable for you to be in an environment with all feeler women? I mean, you, you desired it. You went there on purpose to be around this energy and then it exhausted you. So what was happening in that scenario? Yeah, no, of course I wasn't miserable. I enjoy, I really enjoy being around other women. And in fact, I think that that's pretty much like a hundred percent of, you know, the survey responses when we sort of talk about relationships with men and women and, and how that feels. Most NT women say that they really value their relationships with other women. It's a very important part. It's just, again, there is an underlying assumption that you meet them where they're at, which which is actually, I think, different than 
I mean, I think that that would that comes as a surprise if if you are a feeler woman who is listening to this. I bet this comes as a surprise because there's this assumption I think that feeler women have that they're always trying to accommodate other people, but the the challenge is that the, the accommodation is about tapping into the emotional equilibrium of the other individual or sort of the emotional equilibrium of the dynamic or relationship, and so there's always like a, a an idea of sort of understanding the needs of other people or understanding where other people are at emotionally and and really having your finger on the pulse of that and and wanting the experience to be good for others. And while if if a person if a, if a wo- woman with feeler preferences hasn't done a good job of creating boundaries, she might give too much. This is actually a challenge with all feelers, right? It doesn't matter it doesn't matter how you identify. If you're a feeler the important crucial thing is that you create boundaries so that you don't give too much of yourself and you're also checking in with yourself and making sure that you're getting your needs met. And that's just, I mean, we've talked about that a million times on the podcast. So that's just, that that is a known challenge. I think the reason why this dynamic is even more expensive for people who identify as NT women is because when you have feeling preferences, you are wired to gain intrinsic reward from this kind of mm. uh, this kind of like uh, attention, right? Like, like you you can't give too much. Just like if you there's nothing that's in, indefinite or infinite. There there's abundance, right? Like if you have a lot of money, you can give a lot away. But if you're giving too much away, you'll take a hit. But you have abundance and you have a lot to give. The challenge with being an NT woman is that you start out not having that much to give, but there's still an anticipation that you'll be in abundance around it. And and because you get the message that if you don't have abundance in this area, there's something wrong with you, there's an extra layer of mask that ends up being put up, well, we end up putting it upon ourselves. We don't want to look like we're as clumsy as we are. We don't want to look like we're incompetent in this area. And so we fake it. We fake it all the time. And when we betray ourselves, which the younger we are, the more we betray ourselves because we don't have a seasoning or sophistication or we, we really haven't gotten our mask really well sort of fit on our face yet that, you know, I'm like other women mask. The younger we are, the more hits we take, the more bad feed and negative feedback we get, and the more we, we really refine that mask. We get really good at it. So we learn things like don't tell people what you really think because when you do, everybody else gets mad at you <laughs> because they think that you're trying to cause trouble. And we get the message that we start out quite intimidating. And so we make, you know, we, we create all of these strategies to make it so that we don't intimidate other people. And oftentimes it's by putting ourselves down or, or you know, like kind of deferring to other people or particularly other women. Or we, you know, or, or we do things like uh, we, we kind of hide ourselves completely. We just do a lot of staying home and not hanging out with other people. And we compartmentalize who we are and only blast strength and competence in contexts that we eventually eventually get sensitive enough to know that this is a context that can handle it. So then back at that scenario with the birthday party, are you exhausted from that because you're wearing a mask the whole time? In other words, you're not being yourself. Is that what the drain is for you as an NT woman because you have to pretend or you can't speak your truth? Like, Why is it so exhausting for you? Well, and I, I guess this is a really, I guess I did say mask, and so that probably feel, feels like a lot of pretending. But it's not a mask of inauthenticity. It's a mask of discretion. There's a lot of, I can't say this, I can't say this, I can't say this. So it's really a mask of throttling. It's knowing that in this situation, everybody else gets to sort of express themselves, particularly if it's in a sisterhood context, Everybody feels like, or the people who are in sisterhood context, and this is this is coming from somebody who spent a lot of time doing sisterhood retreats and that kind of thing, you know, about 10 years ago. This is the moment for them to let their hair down, right? Like we're we're just going to be in our full expression of femininity and we're going to just hold each other and hold space and we're just going to like really 
I just marvel in our womanhood, <laughs> which is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, when people who, um, when women who are NTs or probably just thinkers in general, I bet since we're thinkers, women are also going to kind of identify with a bit of this. But I think the reason why NT women in particularly have trouble is, is because they also are dealing with the intuitive blending mask. Which, as we've mentioned a lot, or in previous podcasts, the intuitive blending piece is its own animal. So it's kind of like you have double layers. You've got the intuitive blending piece, and then you've got the thinker blending piece. And when an intuitive thinker woman, quote unquote, lets her hair down, and she she's authentic, like not just authentic, like she's not in if I'm you know suddenly not being fake, but more like I'm being real. There's a difference between being fake and being 100% yourself. And when when a when a person with intuitive thinker preferences lets themselves just be 100% themselves, it's not cuddly, right? It's there's a lot of thoughts in there that are almost inten- like intentionally cut through the harmonious <laughs> sort of warm, snuggly environment and atmosphere. That can only be created if everybody sort of stays a bit above anything that would be controversial, right? Like, like the the less we get into really the muck of how we really feel about how you know what's going on in life and how we honestly solve problems, like the the less we're in that space, then the less conflict gets created. So in order to keep an equilibrium and the morale up and everybody feeling good and feeling, you know, and particularly in sisterhood retreats, feeling really feminine and like you you have to have a container that isn't being disrupted by people's controversial thoughts. When an NT woman lets her hair down, she feels permission to say all sorts of stuff that she knows is going to create controversy. She knows that this is something that most people are not going to be okay with. Because it's not intended to make people feel good. It's intended to refine thought. It's intended to work something out that, you know, like might not even be a complete thought yet, but is just being worked out and and it comes with with a with a detachment from emotional intelligence. Like that's its purpose. Its purpose is that it's on the other side of that polarity. Its perfect purpose is that it's letting go of whether or not people feel good hearing it or whether or not people are like, um, you know, like that, like everybody's gelling with it. The, the point is to say something that people aren't gelling with so that you can go into a sharpening the saw refinement period on the thought itself, on the thought itself, really. So by the end of something like that, the exhaustion is from withholding. The exhaustion is from going, uh, I guess we all had lunch and it was really nice, but we stayed with topics that make us all feel warm and fuzzy. And I was, you know, like multiple times a thought was triggered for me that I realized that there's no way I could say this because if I did every, it would be like in, you know, in the movie Inception, when in the dream, you know, in Inception, when a character is not supposed to be in somebody else's dream and suddenly like the rest of this, you know, the con- the unconscious realizes that. And then like everybody in the dream is now looking at you and pretty soon there's like a rumbling and then all of a sudden there's like pitchforks and, you know, torches and like everybody's like after you because you're not supposed to be there. <laughs> That's what it starts to feel like. You start to say your opinions and suddenly you're you're in somebody else's dream, it feels like. And everybody knows you're not supposed to be there and they get more and more hostile, or at least that's the fear. Or That's been enough of an experience when you're younger. It's hard to let go of that being the inevitable experience that you'll have. And so you, you just learn to be discreet. You learn to meet other people where they're at. You learn that it's so much easier to just kind of pretend you don't think the thoughts you think or you don't feel the way that you do than to deal with constant and perpetual social cleanup. I was actually, you surprised me because I thought you were going to say something very different. But I know thinkers, all thinkers, from my perspective, value competency and proficiency and skill building. Like I think that's something that's a very common thinker trait and what I thought you was going to what I thought you were going to say is that it's exhausting because your feeling process as a thinker woman is less sophisticated. It's going to either be your tertiary 10-year-old process 
or your inferior three-year-old process in the car model we use here at Personality Hacker. Those cognitive functions that are feeling processes are in the back seat and they're less sophisticated. And what I thought you were going to say is being there feels childlike and sometimes makes you feel incompetent. And so you feel silly. And sometimes that it's exhausting because you feel like you keep like resting into that. You're going to feel less than everybody. So you keep pulling away from it. And it's like staying there and staying present to that is, I mean, it could be humiliating on one side, like at the worst case scenario, but just very uncomfortable on the other side. So this idea of being fearful of saying the wrong thing or not wanting to speak truth to keep equilibrium is, I mean, I think that's probably part of it too, but w what would you say about that idea of feeling incompetent? Well, th they're actually one and the same thing. That's, I mean, that we're basically saying the the same thing, which is that when when I'm in a context like that, I am choosing to be more in my 10-year-old or tertiary of extroverted feeling. And and I'm not that great at it. So it ends up like that's probably why I experience it as withholding because I'm like reining in my introverted thinking or accuracy function. <laughs> I'm like trying to make it not just, you know, just F everything up in the in the context. And it does eventually feel really exhausting. But I think the reason why I mentioned it as the 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 energy sieve of withholding is that not everybody is like me like when I talk to ENTP women sometimes INTPs but ENTP women in particular we're the we're the loud mouths we're the ones of the four NT you don't say yeah. <laughs> we're the ones of the four NT women or just four NTs in general but particularly since we're talking about women right now we're the we're the ones that have the hardest time not being controversial, and so we have to create all sorts of strategies to make it so that when we offend everybody, or when we offend one person who like now has to take up the mantle and let us know how offensive we are, like that maybe we've built enough social capital to make it so it's going to be okay, or we are fun and charming and we're the party, and so then people like forgive us anyway because that's just us or whatever. So that's more the ENTP woman challenge. Other NT women have a little easier time of not constantly and perpetually putting their front in the mouth, although ENTJ women also have this challenge. Not so much because they're necessarily saying things that are hurtful to others, which ENTP women do until we realize that we actually have an impact on our environment. That's that's usually our, you know, that's that that's our blind spot is how much we impact other people. ENTJ women understand how they impact other people, but they're just such powerhouses. They just have such like this amazing take charge energy and they're such powerhouses that, you know, like like a lot of ENT women, both ENTPs and ENTJs, their energy enters the room before they do. And they're and they're not sure how to deal with that because that can feel like a domineering masculine energy, which to women in women's spaces they're like, well, who invited this in? <laughs> like, we're not supposed to have this. <laughs> and so then ENTJ women kind of have to figure out how to met out their energy a little bit and make sure that they put on a friendly enough face so that the this energy, this dominating energy is not seen as hostile or like it's trying to harm anybody. Like it's it's in your behalf, not against it. And so they have to create all these strategies to make sure that everybody's like, you know, like they understand that that this is not there's this is not a bull in a china shop scenario. And then I think the INT women, INTJs and INTPs, they have an easier time of being quiet, but the the challenge then is like how do I if you don't do enough test iterate, it's really hard to figure out where you fit in all of this. And it's hard to test iterate when you're already an introvert, when you're already sensitive to the outer world, not reflecting back how you feel about yourself internally. And then if you're just, there's just this offness, right? Like I'm, I'm not like other women. I know I'm not like other women. I'm trying really hard to replicate it. I'm trying really hard to look like I am, but I just can't quite make it. And then as an introvert, my tendency would be to kind of be off to myself and not maybe put my foot in my mouth enough times to get seasoned, right? Because every time I do that, I just take this huge hit. And so then I just kind of feel off for the rest of my life, right? Because the amount of courage or not courage, but the amount of like sort of stamina, I guess the word would be, the amount of stamina it would take to be willing to mess up enough times in order to find my place in all of this just sounds overwhelming. So I think I'm just going to be kind of quiet in the corner the whole time.
So all NT women struggle with this. Whether you're trying to figure out how to like keep your energy from feeling like a shotgun all the time, like in your ENT, or whether or not you're trying to figure out how to fit in all of this without, you know, without having to mess up perpetually and constantly and just kind of like sort of taking ego hit after ego hit, there's just all of these challenges. And so, um, so a lot of times we feel like we're the people who, like we're the people who have to figure it out. And there's nobody to tell us how to do this. Nobody. Like we, we talk to other women and they just kind of look at us and blink and we talk to men and a lot of us actually get along with men more than women, but how is a man supposed to help you find your femininity? Like they're not really going to have very high quality advice. So who am I in this feminine matrix? Where do I fit? Is there any place for me? Am I always going to be on the outside looking in? And oftentimes that's what ends up happening is that there's just this idea. Okay, I guess I guess I'm always going to be on the outside looking in. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. So as far as strategies go, I'm putting together like a, a little short list here of some NT women strategies. And the first one you talked about was that domination or trample energy. Like it's, you move into a space and you just kind of take over and, and maybe you don't want to, but Often, I would assume some women that are wired this way, it's easier just to take over the space or just be in the leadership role. That's the way they can deal with it. And then we also talked about kind of isolating yourself or pulling away from that. And then the third one that we didn't really mention, but is coming up for me, and I want to I want to see if there's any more after this either, but I think there's also a lot of NT women that just surrender. They just hand themselves over to social situations or experiences or... They actually don't have uh, the domination frame, like come in and just take this. And when I say domination, I don't mean like hurt people. I just mean take charge and lead. And they don't isolate or go away or pull away and stay away. They just hand themselves over to the to the situation and let other people set the tone. Would you say there's any other major strategy or categories of strategies that women, NT women typically deploy in these scenarios? Uh, well, I mean, there I can get more specific on how these work, but this is definitely the the things you just mentioned is basically the reason why the cure is worse than the, the disease a lot of times. Yeah, like the strategies that we learn actually mess us up more than if we were just willing to take the hit of being the big stompy, trompy combat boot wearing, you know, <laughs> like like the the troglod like the the woman version of the troglodyte, right? Um. So first of all, uh, a lot of women, I think, I don't know a lot, but I think it's a common, uh, a, a common strategy is to immediately put yourself down around other women because you, because you are, you're afraid that you are going to be intimidating. You're afraid that your domineering or loud energy or just your competence and capability is going to come across like you're somehow somehow you think you're better than everybody else or that you're in some sort of ivory tower or you're looking down on others like like we're really sensitive to that we're really sensitive to other like other people taking our desire to excel as some sort of statement to them that we are looking down on them and so a strategy that we employ is to make fun of ourselves and to constantly be putting ourselves down around other people which all that does is diminish us. And we listen to ourselves talk shit about ourselves. Like we listen to it, we listen to ourselves do that in public often enough so that we create this really weird relationship with our self-esteem and self-confidence. Part of us feels like, yeah, I I could do anything. I'm I, you know, like I'm unstoppable. I could do anything. And that's how you see yourself or at least you want to and you're like, man, I'm going to constantly refine myself to become the best version of myself and that's my internal dialogue. And then I hear myself like 
I hear the words come out of my mouth about how how much I don't have my life together. Oh man, my house is like super, you know, it's super messy. And if I could just keep up and like, oh yeah, I just, I'm terrible at making sure my kid's homework is done or like, I'm a terrible mom, blah, blah, blah. And you can just, we like listen to ourselves, put ourselves down in order to make other feel, people feel good about us because we want relationships. We want people to like us. We don't want people thinking we're snobs or that we're overconfident or that we're there to just take over. We want people to see that we like them and that we want relationships and connection. So how how do you reconcile this idea of like feeling like you, you could just do anything internally if you just put your mind to it with hearing yourself talk shit about yourself? It creates this really weird dynamic. So in that situation, the attempt to make other people feel good about you is a cure is worse than the disease. I think another thing is we get really gun shy about saying th- things that we don't feel is controversial. We don't understand that they're controversial. They're just controversial to others. And and we get so gun shy about it that we then hide who we are enough so that like minds can't find us. Like if there was somebody in the room that would be willing to have this down and dirty conversation they won't hear us even signal that we want that because we learn to just be quiet. We learn to not say things that are controversial. And so if other people would want that and it would and the context would welcome it, we may or may not be good at being sensitive to that. And so then we just again, we hide ourselves and and then we don't find people who are like minded. So again, the cure is worse than the disease. That, that sounds like you're being bullied almost <laughs> like that's the language you're using. Well, and what's interesting is that it sometimes feels that way, even though I think that women who women who make us feel like this, I think would feel terrible if they knew that. They would feel terrible. And there's there's a part of it where um, it's almost like the drama triangle. You know, the the victim victim villain um, hero. Right. Or the the technical one is like um, uh, uh, the persecutor, the victim and the um, savior. Yeah. Yeah. The savior. Like I that. can't remember what the actual words in the, the, the drama triangle. The victim are. villain hero is a great model. I, I think it's good enough. We see ourselves as the villain because that's some of the feedback we've gotten when we're when we are when when we are like a inarticulate, not inarticulate, when we don't use our tools surgically, I'll just say that, when we're still trying to figure out how to communicate tough ideas, when we're still trying to figure out our natural leadership style, when we're still trying to figure out all of these things, these are powerful tools that need lots of seasoning and refinement. But the only way you get seasoning and refinement is over time through misuse and calibration. Like you have to test iterate it. And because this is who we are, we take all of the all the calibrative statements back to us personally. Like we take them as if like we're bad and wrong as people because they're part of our wiring, our natural wiring. And and the piece of understanding that these are powerful tools and so they therefore they must be handled well. This is something that takes a long time to really understand that the tools are not us. Like we are not our intuition. We are not our thinking. We're, that's not us. We're us. We're people who have the basic human needs. And, and it's really hard to not over identify with your wiring. So when we get the feedback that we're not doing it well, it's really hard for us to not go, okay, that's, that, that's me. I'm bad and wrong. And it does kind of feel like bullying or at least actually it's really complicated. It's not bullying per se. It's it's perpetual messaging of how off you are. And in retrospect, it can feel like it was bullying. So it's, it's insistence on conformity. Is that what you're saying? To some extent. Exactly. Exactly. It's a, and it's it's an insistence through assumption. It's it's an it, the the assumptive position is you should be better at these emo, you should be more emotionally intelligent you should be better at knowing how to talk to other women you shouldn't be connecting with 
a man and threatening his partner because you're connecting with him. Like you should know better than to do that. There are all these you should know betters. And we don't always know better and they don't come from bad intent. So there's a lot of project- projection of ill intent. So I actually think, you know, thinking about it more, it's not really bullying. It really isn't bullying. It just is a situation that is, it, it's a bad situation that creates some wounding. Really, that's what it is. It's just wounding. And the wounding has to be navigated through. And oftentimes the wounding comes from other women. And they, they, would, they would feel so bad if they knew that. And in part, it's because they're trying to keep themselves from being wounded by us. And we don't know that we're wounding other people. So it's a lot of like, it's a lot of unintentional cross wounding. <laughs> and it needs, there's a lot of peace that needs to be made there. There's a lot of understanding and sort of cracking the hood open and looking at it and and figuring out like like what's what is mine and what's not mine and what do I have to hold and what can I let go of as a man there's a in the masculine space there's a lot of competition among men and i understand it in the masculine space i'm not a woman so i have no idea how competition shows up for women but it feels like there's some comp- like competition happening in in sisterhood and womanland like women compete with each other in some way that i don't fully understand as a man I understand how men compete, but I don't understand how women compete. Do you sense that? Do you ever feel a competitive nature with other women or from other women? As an NT woman, does, is that, does that show up for you at all? And do you think that shows up for other NT women in any space? I think women are highly competitive, and I think we don't like to think that about ourselves. And so part of how we let other women know that we're not going to compete with them is to really like meet at an equilibrium space. And that's our signal to the other woman that like like I'm not going to compete with you. I think there's probably some of this in mas- in the masculine too. And of course like I mean we all have masculine and feminine energies. We're all going to have masculine competitiveness and we're all going to have feminine competitiveness and we're all going to have feminine collaboration and we're all going to have masculine collaboration however that looks right we're we're all going to have like pieces of yeah of course and so there's there's an attempt to communicate with each other on you know this this level of like i'm 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 not trying to threaten you but there's also a lot of assumption that we're speaking the same language in that energy and so i think sometimes the reason why you know those of us who identify as nt women sometimes aren't good at com- communicating that piece is because we do have a fair amount of masculine energy in our natural wiring. Like m- most of us think, like, like like we say, I mean, one of the things I got back from surveys over and over and over is like, I get along with men better than I get along with women. <laughs> and And it just comes up over and over. And a piece of it is because we're wired in a way that more looks like the masculine. And so we speak we speak that language. But we also, I think, if we let ourselves and get our, give ourselves permission, we also speak the feminine language. So in, in some ways, we, we're sort of a bridge between these two. And I think the reason why we sometimes feel wounded and then do wounding to other women and there's a lot of wounding there, honestly. There's like a lot of need to address that and and understand it and recognize that there's no ill intent anywhere in all of this. But the the reason why there's some wounding is because sometimes we're not speaking enough feminine energy language. We, we're still kind of on a, a different signal. And so when other women are looking for forms of communication from us, we are not as sensitive to that subcommunication signal. And so we, we we over time have to figure out how to ping back. There's no threat here. There's no bad intent. I have goodwill for you and I know you have goodwill for me. And and it takes a while to get there. Now, I'm not saying that all, all uh, women who are feelers are necessarily bad at this. In fact, I mean, some of, some of the most important feminine you know woman influences in my life have been feelers who have very much understood me and very much helped me navigate my own emotional space so i'm not saying this is like all feeler women and all thinker women that they're like you know like a clash to the end like you know locked in mortal battle it's not really as um it's it's not as simple as that and so that's one of the reasons why it's so complex 
is that these things are just really subtle and they're just little pieces of communication here and there and there's like little assumptions and and so it gets real it, it becomes like a ball of yarn that got really sort of mixed up with each other or like sort of um you know it got it got tangled up and so i think a big piece of really understanding the challenges that NT women experience and speaking to you if you're an NT woman, in part of it, it's not necessarily getting to like, well, this is how we solve the problem. Some of it is just solving the problem through camaraderie. It's just talking to other NT women going, I know, right? It's weird, isn't it? It's just, a, it's just feeling like we're not total aliens. We're not strangers in a strange land. There are others like us. And a piece of it is the catharsis of knowing that none of this is intended poorly or badly. It's just really, it's it's what happens when you are wired unlike other people. And lots of subcultures experience this. There's tons of different sub, you know, like smaller demographics of people who are very different than everybody else who just don't gel with the, you know, whatever has been considered the norm. And being able to talk to somebody who recognizes a very unique challenge, the center of some very odd circles in a Venn diagram, of just being able to talk to the other person and go, yeah, I mean, that's exactly how I feel. Man, there is so much, there's so much steam that gets, you know, sort of let, like let off. And none of it is poorly intended. You know, none of it is intended to harm. All of it is just, we're navigating through life and we're doing the best we can and we're just overvaluing our own experience. But it's recognizing, I think, for you, if you are, if you identify as an NT woman, it's recognizing that I know that you, you go over, like you, you go above and beyond, even if you don't get the return on going above and beyond, even if you never get the fruits of your labor, because you're just, you're just kind of figuring out how to like, find your place in the world and do the best you can and not not you know get too much hostility back and <laughs> like like I know you're working overtime to just be like everyone else and that's really expensive that's very exhausting and I want you to know I I know that and there's hundreds of other people who are like you that know that too because they're doing the other, the same thing I I mean actually arguably millions and I've read the survey responses from hundreds of them. And so, yeah, I, I know it and it's hard and, um, and, and you're not alone. I learned about this idea in the past couple of years about emotional labor. And I learned about it. Some women were reporting, I think mostly feeler women were reporting that specifically I heard it from, that they felt they had to do emotional labor for people in certain contexts that was really... It was things that were asked of them above and beyond what maybe their job or their role entailed. So, for example, someone maybe as a server at a restaurant or in a healthcare situation or even in a family dynamic, you know, with a spouse or children or extended family, you know, there's the, there's the job itself, like helping prepare for a holiday meal, but then there's also all the emotional labor to make sure people feel good and the hosting or in a job role, there's like the job itself, but in a service industry role or a healthcare industry role, there's all this emotional labor that has to happen beyond the specific role that you're fulfilling. And I, it was a, it was a really awakening to me to see this. And I'm like, okay, I, I see that there's, there's these things that people are doing in these roles, men and women, but I think women are particularly reporting this right now. And when you just said that, that NT women, you may never be recognized for this. You're having to do extra labor to come and meet people, not just other women, but men and, you know, people in general. It made me think there's probably the equivalent of quote unquote emotional labor for all of us. Like there's somebody that doesn't have to do the emotional labor, like how I just defined it, how I learned it in the last couple of years. But maybe there's a different version of that in some other way. And I'm having this intuitive thought that we probably all have this cross to bear, if you will, that other people just don't see the labor we put into stuff, that we have to go the extra mile, all of us, in whatever way we show up. And what I hear you saying is there's a particular way that NT women have to show up in an analog to this idea of emotional labor. I don't know if it's emotional labor, maybe it's thought labor, I have no idea. But this idea of extra labor that has to be put into something. Well, I do believe 
that as a principle that everybody is doing labor based on their wiring, like what they the the position they occupy in the social ecosystem, they are providing extra. I do believe that 100 percent. And so um, I, I think recognizing the concept of emotional labor as a an envoy into recognizing all different kinds of labor that people provide, I think that that is a very powerful reframe. But to specify it, to take it from a 20,000 foot view, abstract, everybody's got one of these, to make it more specific to the subject at hand, which is NT women, is that I think what you just said is probably where where I was struggling to explain that assumptive level the assumptive level is that NT women will also be providing emotional labor and we're not that good at it like we really struggle to do that gotcha and so we are it is assumed that we'll be providing that emotional labor as well because of you know because of assumed gender roles and the assumption of like um you know like just the the patterns we create in life if women do this then all women should be able to do this and for feeler women, they provide all this emotional labor and, and and it feels like it's too much, but there's also a component that they're naturally skilled at it. So then the question is like, well, how much do I give my talents away and are people recognizing my talents and are, you know, it's like, it's kind of more in sort of the, am I, is there ROI for the thing that I'm naturally good at and being assumed that I'll just provide. But now add a component of the assumption that you're good at it and you're not that good at it at all. But you still have to have to provide it because otherwise people think you're not a good person if you don't. Right. So now there's like one extra layer of difficulty on top of that whole conversation about emotional labor. And then because we naturally want to be competent and capable, we create lives and try to do lifestyle design in which we're doing the thing that we are good at, which is oftentimes thought labor. And then we're then people start to rely on us to do that for them, too. So that's the thought labor piece is a little bit more rewarding because we're naturally good at it. And but at the same time, because we're naturally good at that, sometimes that's seen as being competitive or threatening to others because we're not supposed to be good at that. So we bring that to the table and we're good at it and and we're and that's not what women are supposed to be. And so and so then there's this idea of like you're getting ahead of yourself like. Like, I know that just by showing up as an intelligent, articulate woman, there's a percentage of the population that is turned off by me simply occupying that space. Like, just because I'm an intelligent woman, that alone is enough of a turnoff. And then on top of that, to be assertive and articulate, then that gets, there's a trigger in people's ideas that that means that I'm domineering, which actually I'm not at all. I'm like the worst person to dominate any situation because I hate leadership. I hate people listening to what I'm, you know, like, like looking to me to tell them what to do. I totally hate that. Now I want to be influential with my thoughts. I love people thinking my thoughts are intelligent and influencing them on that level, but I hate people trying to put me in a position of leadership when I'm telling them what to do. I hate it. So there's actually despite the fact that I come across as somebody who's assertive and, and intelligent and articulate, like that's where I want the interaction to end. I don't want you putting any responsibility on me in any other way. <laughs> but there is an assumption that if I'm doing those things, it's because I'm trying to power grab. I'm trying to grab all that responsibility or all that leadership, and it couldn't be further from the truth. So the way that I show up misrepresents to other people what I want and my desires and and so it's going to be a turnoff that I'm coming in and just trying to take over, which I never am. <laughs> never am trying to take over. But there's an there's all these assumptions about what my intent is. And then on top of that, not only am I off-putting to a percentage of the population because I show up looking like that, but I'm also off-putting because I'm not doing all the things that I'm supposed to be, which is, you know, feminine and emotionally intelligent and, and doing emotional labor. So it's just like, it, you know, I just have gotten to a place where I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to be perpetually misunderstood. And that's just the thing. That's just what it is. And that's why earlier I was like, hey, you NT woman, I see you. I know that that's probably going on for you too. whatever your version of what I just said is, whatever it is, like maybe change some of the spe specifics. But there's always that sense that we are going to be alone. Like we just are like nobody's going to get us. And I know that there's other types out there, particularly feeling types who feel that they will be perpetually misunderstood because of how they think. 
But now add a component where nobody expects you to be what you are simply because of your gender. And so like it just gets real complicated. And uh, and so, again, I think a big solution, the reframes are fantastic, perspective shifts, like taking the responsibility of becoming more emotionally intelligent is a huge part of it. And that is on us to do. And like, like never getting whiny about it and never getting victimy about it. Like that's really important because we are terrible victims. Anti-women make the worst victims. We are terrible at it. So never, never, never take the victim role. And also recognize that you're not alone. <laughs> like that's the most important thing is that there are others. There's millions of others. And if you can find one and just just have that moment of like, I know, right? And that catharsis. And the space, the space to talk openly and not have to worry about being diplomatic and not having to worry about being politically correct and not having to censor everything you're saying. Like those, I call them unsafe spaces. Those are crucial. It's crucial to, to create unsafe spaces where you can just talk shit and, every, and, and the other person will hold space for it. Um, you know. And, uh, and, they, and they won't take it personally and they won't get offended and they won't think that you're doing it to, to them. Um, those, are, those are incredibly important places. You are on fire talking about NT women, Antonia. Am I? <laughs> I feel like I'm <laughs> Just like really kind of... A prophet. I, Preach it, sister. I, you know, this, this is probably so personal to me and yeah. so near and dear to my heart. I feel like I didn't do a very good job articulating. I, I feel like I really stumbled through it. But your energy has been building this whole time. Like I can just feel it building and building, and you're getting more into the the topic and the the conversation. Well, I, I've done I've done a lot of work around this, trying to sort of figure out my place in all of this, and um, and I I feel like there's still things that I'm really making connections around, like really carving out some sophisticated neural pathways that I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost there, but I, I know that there's still a little bit more that I am refining. And so, um, so it's very personal to me. I do a lot of work around thinking around this. I've gathered so many tools and resources thinking about this, but I still know that when I get going, I'm in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, th thank you for saying I'm on fire. I, I hope that I hope that what I said was clear enough so that if you, you know, you, the listener, do identify as an NT woman, that this, you know, that, that you, you got the transmission, <laughs> like the signal was clear enough so that you feel understood. So what do you think? You've been here with us in this conversation, the third person here that you haven't had a mic, but now is your chance to come over to personalityhacker.com, leave your comment, ask a question, or share your story. Are you an NT woman? Have you had some of the experiences we talked about today? Have you found strategies outside of this, outside of the ones we articulated that have worked for you, or maybe ones you tried that didn't work? I mean, hearing those two would be really beneficial for us and other NT women in the community at large. So if you want to make your voice heard, come over and leave a comment directly below this podcast. Yeah, and if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave a rating and review on iTunes, that helps us out a lot. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it at all major book retailers. And if you leave a rating and review on Amazon or on Goodreads for that book, that also helps us out a lot. And we have a suite of programs that are personal growth oriented and tailored to your personality type. So if that's interesting to you and you'd like to invest in yourself and in us, you can head over to personalityhacker.com and look at our catalog of personal growth programs. Personal growth programs, some of them are designed for intuitive thinkers specifically. So you might find one that fits you as an intuitive thinker, woman particularly, and I think that would be a really great uh, avenue for your personal growth. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, 
to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.